All right, welcome to today's webinar, Mobile App Ad Tech, What's New for Publishers in 2017? Uh, we very much appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And we've got about 45 minutes, give or take, of very informative and we hope very helpful information to help app owners and app developers navigate the world of mobile app monetization and performance. Uh, my name is Jay Hinman, and I am the VP of Marketing at NewMob, and I will be the host of this webinar. But very quickly, I'm going to get out of the way and turn this over to experts from Smato and AdTherent before uh, coming back with a short presentation myself on mobile ad delivery. So let's meet our panelists and tell you, you know, today's focus is on helping you sort through new trends and solutions in mobile app ad tech this year. And so after each presenter shares their slides, about 10 minutes each, we will have time at the end for your questions. So if, if you can see in your GoToWebinar software, you'll see a questions tab. So just type your question there if you have one and make sure to address it to one of our speakers or to all of us. Um, and I'll tell you who you're hearing from so you know who to address it to. We'll be hearing today first from Garrett McGrath, who is the SVP of Product Strategy at Smato. And he's going to be talking about mobile video advertising comes to mobile video, diversification formats and the future. Next up will be Matt Groner from AdTherent, and he will be sharing mobile verification and attribution trends for 2017. And then I will talk a bit about how mobile app acceleration links ad delivery and app user satisfaction. And that, of course, will be followed by questions from you for all of us. Also recording this thing today so you can, you'll be getting a link to it after it's all done. So let's get started with Garrett McGrath from Smato. Garrett, over to you. Garrett, are you there? Sorry about that. Still on mute. <laughs> You're good now. Thank you. R rookie move. Sorry about that. Okay. You see my screen? Yep. No problems. Cool, cool. cool. Sorry about that. Uh, so as stated, um, thanks very much for joining us today. Sorry about the 10 seconds of silence. Uh, my name is Garrett McGrath. I'm part of the product team at Smato, and we're going to talk a bit about video advertising with respect to mobile today. Uh, two seconds about Smato. Um, I'm not here to talk to you about Smato, but um, in case you don't know, we are a mobile advertising uh, exchange, real-time real bidding ad exchange, uh, and mobile ad server. Um, we are specifically and only dedicated to mobile, and I show this slide um, not for impressive numbers, but just to sort of illustrate the fact that we we deliver ads to a lot of people, uh, over a billion people per month, in pretty much every country. So, um, you know, we have a really good view on, on, on what's happening in the mobile monetization marketplace, and, and especially as it relates to mobile, that's not everything we do. I would say that we're more like a, a format agnostic <clears throat> Exchange, but of course we, we focus heavily on mobile because the uh, the market does as well. <clears throat> so, what's going on in digital ad spend in general uh, from 2013 to 2019? Last year, being 2016, was really the first time that mobile spend outpaced desktop. Um, and if you look at the the estimates for 2019, the digital marketing spend for mobile far outpaces desktop. So this is a Pretty major change. Uh, if you look look back at 2013, which in, in you know ad tech space is not that far back, um, it, you know it was, it was very much the, the other way around. Um, we all know that we live in a mobile first world, but um, <clears throat> ad spend is finally kind of catching up to that, and a, and a major portion of that is mobile, and, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Or, I'm sorry, video. Uh, <clears throat> so in 2017, 6.7 billion dollars will be spent on mobile video. So that's almost 20% of, of U.S. mobile ad spending in total, um, a huge number. Nobody likes to look at, at slides like this, but um, just to give you a little bit more um, uh, background to those numbers, if you look at the growth of desktop in general from 2014 to 2020 as projected, it's more or less flat, which, you know, it's been growing leaps and bounds for the last 10 plus years. But mobile is maybe 6 or 7x in that time, in that frame time in the time span. But uh, at the same time, desktop doesn't exactly slow down, it just kind of gets flat. 
But if you look at the, the, the projected growth in video, especially on mobile, um, you know, the, from $1 billion to $17 billion in 2020, it's a massive spike uh, in terms of the types of ads that are being consumed on mobile devices. <coughs> so if we have a, a sense of the scale, um, what are the types of ad units, what are the types of experiences that are being used and will be used in the future in order to generate something like $17 billion worth of spend? Um, <coughs> if, if we kind of start with the boring, where we are today, um, you know, the first uh, mobile advertisements or mobile video ads that came to mobile uh, were what we call in-stream. Uh, they're traditional, they're full screen ads, they appear in the device's native video player, so outside of the experience of whatever app or website you're using. Um, <clears throat> they're almost always part of video content, so they're pre, mid, or post roll ads for, with, for or within video content. They kind of take over the entire screen. Usually you get an, an X button, everyone's seen one, probably you've you know, dismissed it very quickly. Um, but this is where the mobile video market basically started. Um, and in, in this in this term called in-stream, which means in-stream video content. <coughs> Pardon. Shortly thereafter, uh, and recently, we've got we've also moved into outstream. Uh, outstream is a video ad unit that actually plays within content and within non-video content. Uh, so you know, you know, basically, an, a video ad that appears on a page the same way content or an ad otherwise does. Um, shorthand, shorthand for this experience is sort of Facebook video. Um, most people have you know, been, been scrolling by Facebook video or any number of other news sites, social media sites, anything that has a scrolling behavior. <clears throat> and if you experienced an ad that, if you notice it, when you, usually when it gets to 50 or so percent in view, it starts playing. It's usually auto mute, but it, it'll start playing and it gives you the opportunity to engage with it. And if you keep scrolling past, you get 50 percent or so of it out of you, it'll stop playing. Uh, so Outstream is uh, something that's gotten a lot of adoption in the last several years. It's continuing to grow heavily. Um, you know, there were some sort of video purists in the last two or three years that were um, not, so, not so enthused about the Outstream format just because it's sort of it doesn't immerse the user in, in the video. Um, but at the same time, it gives users the opportunity to elect to interface with it, to, to elect to watch it, to elect to listen to it, without it, without it totally interrupting the flow of, of their uh, their experience and whether or not whatever app they're using. <clears throat> We're very much related to outstream video, but a little bit different. Uh, something that also um, is very common to these days and still is growing leaps and bounds is something called rewarded video. Um, rewarded video typically happens in, in or most frequently happens. Uh, uh, in in-app games, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Um, the concept behind rewarded video is the user of, of the game or of the thing, uh, typically a game, uh, is offered some sort of reward for watching the video. There are, you know, points or a new sword or a new something that, that's germane to the, the, the game or the experience that they're having with the app, and there, there's sort of an offer made. You know, if you watch this video, we'll, we'll give you X amount of points or, or lives or, or, or a new song or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> um, that's very interesting for advertisers because as soon as the, the person elects to watch the video, they, they've opted in and they're going to watch the entire thing in order, in order to get the, the reward or to get the, the prize, so to speak. So um, the number of views may be, may be less, but the, the advertisers know that when someone's actually watching one of these things, they're, they're engaged in watching it. It's a full screen experience. Um, they're going to watch the entire thing because they're, you know, they're doing it in exchange for whatever it is they've been promised. So in-stream and out-stream, you know, naturally there are many other um, technologies and flavors and things like MRAID, which is video inside Rich Media, which is sort of in-banner video. There's a lot, a lot of other ways to, to accomplish video in, mo in a mobile environment these days, but, but in-stream and out-stream are sort of the big two buckets and, and, and very common. But how does the industry get from $6 billion to $17 billion in spend in just a couple of years? Well, well, we'll talk about where they're going. Um, vertical video is one of the <clears throat> most important and next things to talk about. Um, this is already, frankly, very much in adoption in certain um, publishers, certain apps. Um, you know, Bloomberg told us earlier this year or last year that there was 10 billion daily vertical ad views per day uh, on Snapchat. Uh, so, you know, Snapchat is one of the apps that sort of pioneered this. 
Um, but there are really a lot of major pubs moving to vertical ads. Uh, I think Hearst, CNN, uh, National Geographic, Food Network, there are several others that come to mind <coughs> that are, are developing ads that are specifically vertical, they're specifically for the mobile environment. There's also a number of apps that you know are very vertical in nature. Uh, Periscope, Meerkat, YouTube, or Vine, formerly Vine. Uh, all all of those um, all of those apps are intended to use the the, ver the vertical user experience of a person walking around with their phone doing something live. You know, similar to Facebook Live or something like that. Um, <clears throat> it's it's really important to note from an industry point of view from a digital advertising point of view, that these are the, some of the first ad units that were specifically conceived with, with mobile in mind. Um, yes, many ad units over many years recently have been you know, repurposed or resized or customized for the mobile environment. But you know, in, the, in the case of video specifically, they're almost always shot landscape. Um, and, and the concept of shooting a, vid a video vertically for the specific use of it appearing in mobile is something brand new. Um, as stated, the, the, the industry is moving there quickly, major publishers are getting there, uh, but it's still, you know, even with 10 billion views on Snapchat, it's still, it's still a very new thing because it's very specific to, to Snapchat. <clears throat> so beyond vertical, um, there are things like augmented reality. Um, you know, this is something that's been done very little. It was done earlier this year with a Spotify Coca-Cola campaign where um, there were special Coke cans that had signals on them that were if you if you pointed your phone while in Spotify within this particular ad at, at the can, you were able to sort of interact with the uh, you know a, 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 a basically an augmented reality. You were able to interact with the can or interact with with the ad in in a way that you know obviously wasn't wasn't exactly real, uh, but in, enabled you to use physical objects to trigger the ad experience. Um, you know, very unique kind of bridging the gap between the physical and the digital um, and really, you know, the engagement, if you get someone to sort of start playing with this, um, the engagement itself transcends the concept of an, of an ad. You know, if, if, you're, if you're manipulating songs or you're, or you're getting new songs in the case of Spotify or listening to something new, um, as, a, as a part of the ad experience, you, you're really blurring the lines between whether or not it's an ad, whether or not it's something you've elected to watch in exchange for something, it's, it becomes a little bit more of a, a almost a, a game or an experience. And again, obviously, this was conceived with, with mobile in mind. You know, these are ad units and, and, and marketing dollars and agency dollars being spent specifically for mobile. <clears throat> uh, two more things to happen, things to come in the future that are, that are being talked about, uh, things that have been proposed by the, the IAB that the, the uh, the industry is considering, some people are obviously doing it in, in small scale. Uh, one of them is 360 degree video. Um, the images here make it hard to kind of look at because 360 really requires that you interact with it. But <clears throat> if you imagine clicking on the top picture in, in the left hand uh, image and then being served this full screen image of, of that thing you, you clicked on, this little, this little black dot in the lower left hand corner indicates where the, the user's finger is. And in, in this ad, you're actually able to scroll around in a, in a 360 degree view, vertically and horizontally, and, and immerse yourself in this, in this case, landscape. Um, you're able to actually you know, inter interact with it, but also look around in, in this world of this ad. And ultimately, you know, this, this, this ad or this world results in some sort of advertisement. But it really borrows from our, our very commonly used map habits on, on a phone. You know, every, you know, everybody these days uses this, uh, a map app to you know, get places or find places or figure out where they are or whatever the case may be. And, and um, scrolling around with your finger in this sort of virtual world, even especially if you're at Street View sometimes you know, in Google Maps, um, <clears throat> you know, this is very similar to that experience, but, but, but the advertiser is sort of gamifying the ad experience. Uh, and, you know, it, it's turning it into something much more immersive and some, something that you, you know, much more so than even just clicking on, on a video and saying, yes, I'm willing to watch it. Um, you're, you're able to sort of look around and, and conceivably discover an ad or discover something useful, discover something fun to do. Um, and, you know, provided the ad creative is, is that good, you get to the end of it, you have some sort of payoff that, that, that you know, lives up to that, that promise. Um, and again, obviously, something conceived with mobile in mind. 
Um, last but not least, uh, the concept of virtual rea reality. Um, you know, this, the concept of VR and especially 360 video in, in a virtual reality environment um, completely unplugs all other <laughs> expectations from the, the concept of, of video ads. Um, you know, if you can immersively gamify the ad experience and, and if you're in a true VR headset world, you know, does, does the ad disappear? You know, are you even in an advertisement anymore? Depends on the quality of the creative and the quality of the message and who you are and how, how it's reached you. Um, but you know, these types of things are already being developed for the VR world. And um, actually, this screenshot here is if, if you just type in IAB 360 into YouTube, you'll, you'll find this video. Um, and you know, it, it attempts to to mimic the, the 3D view, but of course, it's, you know, uh, on your desktop or on your phone in, in YouTube. But you know, if you imagine translating this this ad unit into this, uh, the immersive world of, of virtual reality, and then understand that, that video ad units are actually being built today for this type of, of world, <laughs> so I use the word world loosely, um, you know, you, you start to understand that, that advertisements and video ads are being complete, conceived with completely new mobile paradigm. You're still mobile. Um, you're still, you know, you're, you're maybe even more mobile than, than having your phone. Uh, but if you're walking around a room in your house, but you're walking around a world in, in your eyes, um, you know the the concept of virtual reality and the concept of, of advertisements, and you know, I, I immediately think of you know, Blade Runner and, and those things that we saw many years ago. Um, it, it all starts to, to very much blur, and the, the really interesting thing is it's it's beginning to happen today. Uh, you know, VR, the Oculus, or the Samsung goggles, or all those things. You know, the, you know, we all know that VR is like here, but also very much around the corner in, in a major way, um, and. Uh, it's interesting to, to, to realize that the, the marketers and, and the advertisers and the creative folks, all of whom are, are anticipating and working on this already today and, and working toward uh, a world where, you know, hopefully advertisement, advertisements and advertising are, are seamless to, to what you're doing. And, and if they can somehow uh, change the concept of rewarded into something that's, you know, it's almost like you don't have to be asked if you want to do it. You, you, you do want to do it based on what you're doing and maybe, you know, the thing at the end of the ad message is of interest to you or they already know it's of interest to you, How, however that happens, um, you know, the, the concept of the advertisement basically disappearing the same way they say the, the internet's going to disappear into, into uh, you know, objects uh, is a really fascinating thing to me and, and I think I hope to you as well. Um, but ultimately, <clears throat> ad units like this are, are how this, this sort of hockey stick growth of video, ad, video advertising in a mobile environment will happen between now and, you know, 3x the, year, the, 3X the numbers we're, we're looking at for 2017, which is around $6 billion to almost $18 billion by 2020. And uh, that's it for me, Jay. Okay, thanks a lot. We are now going to switch over to Matt Groner from Adtherent. I'm going to turn the control of the panel over to him. Go ahead, Matt. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Very well. All right. A little trickery here. There we go. And everybody sees my ad parent logo. Sure it is. Excellent. Um, okay, so yeah, I am uh, Matthew Groner. I run product here at Adtherent. Um, I should have thought to do a nice little background slide, but I didn't. So uh, we are a managed service uh, DSP. Um, we are connected to 30 exchanges. We evaluate over 50 billion impressions a day. Um, and what I thought I'd bring to this for, for the publisher folks here is to talk about how we look at the data we get from um, the exchanges, from the publishers, and the real disconnect we see between targeting that data and what advertisers are looking for in verification and attribution and ultimately optimization. So right now there is a huge disconnect between um, 
the data and the quality of the exchange data that's being used for targeting and what's being uh, verified. So generally what we see um, for targeting data and what is coming across from the exchanges, so there's content information, the, the site information or app information, uh, and IAB categories. There's device information around type, OS model, uh, demographic information, uh, age and gender, um, and then depending on uh, the links between um, third-party uh, data providers, uh, what segments are available based on those uh, integrations. Um, Geo and location, so we're either seeing IP-based or lat long. Um, and this is, I would say, that one of the, the biggest growth areas in targeting and one of the biggest disconnects. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then on user information, we're seeing you know, IDFA, AID, and cookies. So that's what's being used by most folks to target today. But no, no. Oh, here we go. But what's being used for verification is these various attribution and verification partners and their data sets. So um, you know, this is not comprehensive by any means, but this is you know some of the players we see here. Um, location, folks like Ninth Decimal and Placed. Uh, content and device, uh, everyone is doing it, but you know most often we'll see that being shown up on verification reports from you know three of the largest verification partners, Mode IS and DV. Uh, demographic, it's Comscore and Nielsen, and user data, you know two of the big ones, Blue Kai Data Logics. There's many other players in the space. So right away you see there's an obvious disconnect between the data sets out there that are being used for verification and what's being used for targeting and um, it, it creates big problems for advertisers, it creates big problems for those of us who are trying to execute campaigns and buy that inventory. Uh, now you already saw that. I'm not going to talk about viewability and fraud, I could spend the whole hour talking about that. That's uh, uh, conversation we've sat through many times before. I'm happy to have that conversation with anybody who wants to have that, but that's not the goal of today. So that is not the verification we're looking at here. Um, so I just pulled some numbers, uh, our own internal numbers. I, I don't claim that these represent uh, the industry at large, but seeing you know 50 billion bid requests per day, I feel that we have a pretty good handle on the vast majority of the mobile data out there. And we run some tests. And when we use just the data coming directly from the publishers through the, uh, through the exchanges without any sort of uh, you know, verification on our end, massaging the data, um, we get very low results. Only 30% uh, of the uh, impressions appear in the demo that they say they're in. Um, uh, depending on the campaign, 45 to 50 percent will appear in the geofence based on the IP or lat long. Um, 28 percent tend to be out of the content category they say they're in based on uh, verification partners. And then there's a big range here for client CRM match. This is really comparing cookie and uh, you know device ID information against what we bring on as uh, client data that they want to target directly. Um, but still, e even on the top end, there are 40 percent. It's still exceedingly low. So how we address this? within Ad Theorem is we do tremendous amount of work um, mining the data we receive, cleaning it, verifying it, um, and, and we take a lot of different approaches to that. So for content we look to uh, normalize the app IDs and really combine those. Uh, it allows us to build you know, consistent whitelists and blacklists and you know, frankly one of the things that we do is where we consistently see bad data, we just 
we block those publishers. We won't buy them. It's it's not worth it for us. Um, and we add some third-party content verification into our own systems as well around that content, which allows us to have a separate data set to target against. Um, device, we'll do our own lookup from the user agent rather than use the uh, device information coming uh, directly from the uh, bid request. And we also work to normalize that. So if an advertiser is tar trying to target tablets or trying to, to tar target certain OSs or makes or models, that we're able to target those successfully without having to rely directly on the uh, data from the bid request. Um, for the demographic data, we do a lot of work, and I'll talk more about the our own device mapping system that we've built to bring on client CRM data and make that targetable. Um, we also do a tremendous amount of work with the geolocation received. Uh, we remove bad map long data. Uh, we look at these, we survey across all the lat longs, we start to look at things that are centroids of city, state, zip, and when we see those consistently for maps, we'll know that it's not a true lat long, that this is just being derived from a centroid, maybe an IP lookup that is then being passed off as something else. Um, we validate the lat long versus the IDs, that's by Looking at where we see that device at other times, the IP and the lat long together, uh, if they don't match, um, and we collect the lat long by ID over time to see patterns there, which allow us to target much better. Um, and then the uh, uh, within that um, cross-device system that we build, uh, that, that allows us to connect users to multiple devices and cookies, which we use for targeting as well. Oh, we got there we go. So our device graph um, is, is one of the solutions among many that we've built that allow us to combine all this data, this clean data, to make much more accurate targeting for us. Um, it, it combines the cookies, it combines the IP addresses, it combines the location data and the Wi-Fi, and we bring that all together. Um, we currently have over uh, 600 million devices mapped to 90 million households, and we are constantly updating that. Um, and this allows us to onboard the data directly. Uh, it allows us to do reach and frequency capping, uh, across users, across devices with that clean data and provide real value to the advertisers when they're able to see it this way. But as a publisher, what can you do? Um, there's some real opportunities uh, on a basic level. Um, sending no data is better than incorrect data. Where we see publishers consistently send bad data, that will cause them to end up on block lists just because it, it's not worth it for us to try and continually clean or adjust that when the, when the data is so wrong. Um, normalize uh, the data you send across your, your network when you have a, a group of uh, apps. Um, the, the best thing you can do is, is send them all the same. Uh, it makes the data clean. It makes it more likely that we're going to buy it. Same thing with following IAB and RTB standards. Um, when things, the data we receive is outside of that, it makes it more difficult for us to clean. It makes it much uh, less likely that we're going to be able to fit that in the buckets we need so we can buy that. Um, and then can continually validate the network and your network partners to understand that they are sending good and clean data uh, that's accurate. Um, so those are, those are some of the, the basic things publishers can do to improve their data to m more align the targeting data they're sending with the uh, attribution and verification partners. Uh, and that's all I have for today. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks very much, Matt. And uh, this is Jay Hinman from Newmob again. Let me just maximize my screen here. All right, 
So Numob is not strictly a quote-unquote ad tech company. Um, we found, though, that our mobile app acceleration solution is being disproportionately deployed by publishers who monetize their apps via advertising. So I'm going to talk about what this means, why overall app user satisfaction is you know, kind of somewhat counterintuitively at least partially connected with how fast and how reliably ads get delivered to them within a mobile app. The most important thing to note really is that when an ad isn't delivered or displayed, in most cases the publisher and the app owner doesn't get paid, right? So we found that in working with apps in every corner of the world, that anywhere between 2 to 40% of mobile app ad requests aren't delivered, either because the ad wasn't fast enough to be received through the mobile network and displayed to the user, or because there were some in-app errors and timeouts that prevented the ad from even arriving at all. And of course, this is very dependent on country, and more importantly, on the mobile networks within those countries. So for instance, an LTE or a 4G network in the United States will not have the issues that a 2G or a 3G network in India does, for example, right? But mobile users generally don't know what sort of network they're on, or they don't care. And if they do know, there's really not a whole lot they can do about it. So here are some rates of non-delivery that we've seen for a major entertainment app that's deployed all over the world, just from this past month. And it shows the ad requests, the ads that weren't delivered, and the percentage that weren't delivered in this app. And note that this is an app with Numob's mobile app acceleration SDK. It's turned off, so you can kind of see what happens in the wild. Um, and you can see some pretty big discrepancies, too, that point out to just how volatile network conditions can be. So even in the United States on MoPub's ad network, for instance, over 20% of ads weren't actually being delivered to end users, with over 36% not arriving in China. And millennial media's numbers were a little bit better overall, but it points to missed revenue opportunities and really to a potentially very frustrating user experience with interstitials that hang and don't load, and blank spaces where banner ads should be, and so on. In terms of how long it takes these ads to load, I'm now going to share some stats from three different ad networks, all running in the same app, and show country by country discrepancies that point to the same problem. So again, this is that same app that uses Numob to speed up their app performance, but with the Numob SDK turned off. So here's what we see from Mopub. It was only half a second to load an ad in the US, but over 1.1 seconds in Singapore, for instance. Uh, Turkey, not too bad, but India was nearly twice as bad as that. And sometimes these results can really be surprising, and they're really based on where the aggregated users actually are when the majority of the requests are made, for instance, in a strong coverage area during non-peak hours. Here are the results for the same app, but using millennial media instead of MOPA. It's a little bit faster overall, but it has the same kind of huge discrepancies and network dependencies. U.S. ads loaded in 316 milliseconds, but in China they loaded in 832 milliseconds. Um, ads in the United Kingdom loaded in 432, but in India they were 1,155 sec milliseconds. And it looks like, you know, from this that Nepal was the worst of all. So if that happens to be your main market for app monetization, you are definitely going to want to make sure that you're measuring your performance in Nepal. Finally, here is the same app using App11, which had the quickest results of the three ad networks we measured, but was still with some wide gaps in performance. With Pakistan, Pakistani mobile apps, for instance, were loading eight times slower than they did in the Netherlands. So this is just all kind of demonstrative about the network dependencies that you see. So with this in mind, I mean, it's really important to take stock of where app developers and app owners tend to focus when it comes to SDKs and third-party tools. Most apps these days, they diagnose and help fix app crashes with tools like Apptelligent and Crashlytics and things like that. Uh, but fixing the next order user experience problem with slow apps, plus app errors and timeouts and ads that don't show up, it's only just in the past year becoming a key focus for app developers and owners around the world. Let's talk a little bit about those app errors and timeouts. They're really especially frustrating to users. These are things like an ad that never loads or content that never loads, no matter how long the user waits. Or it's missing images or purchases that fail or an app that just freezes or hangs and won't proceed to the next interaction. This is usually enough for users to close the app, close the app entirely and uh, complete their transaction on a different app or to go spend their time elsewhere rather than in this poor performing app. 
mobile apps have error rates that just like ad delivery are highly variable and they really depend on mobile network conditions. So we found that a typical error rate is between 3 to 12 percent with low errors in countries with better networks like the US and higher in countries like India or China where we're seeing up to 12 percent in-app errors. And really what compounds all of this is the vast array of third-party API calls that are being made from a typical mobile app which really makes those apps more complex than they've ever been. And you know, these, these API calls are everything from content feeds uh, to ad networks, payment systems, and then to the various SDKs that are embedded within the app, all of which of course are very useful and they make the app full of features and functionality, but they also do a lot to slow down performance. So what's an app owner to do? Um, the solution we believe is like not, don't just focus on making individual pieces of your app faster, but instead accelerate everything in the app, even those third party calls and everything that the app does, you know, the advertisements within it, the content feeds, the other SDKs and so on. The reason why this is tough is the biggest problem is that last mile that app traffic travels, which is that handoff from the edge of the internet right across the mobile network and right into the device in the user's hand. This happens to be where 70 to 90 percent of all app latency occurs. And so what we do at NewMob is we inject a two-line bit of code into the app through our SDK, and then the app's traffic, then it'll travel across our global acceleration network rather than across the normal mobile network path. If you happen to be familiar with how CDNs work for the desktop web, we you know, like Akamai and things like that, we do something very similar, but it's exclusively designed for mobile apps and only for mobile apps. And we even give it away to startups for free, so up to 50 gigabytes of traffic per month, so it's really easy to get started with no commitment. And just here's an example of, you know, kind of what happens for ad delivery. So we showed HTTP response times for mobile ads without new mob switched on earlier. But here's what happens when everything in an app is sped up. Each ad network delivers ads at a much, much faster rate, and it means more ads seen by consumers and more revenues for the publisher overall. Uh, we wrote a whole white paper about it. If you want to go a little bit deeper, it's called The State of Advertising Monetized Apps. It's not just a big advertisement for our company. It talks about some of the challenges just in, in monetizing your app via advertising, and it's free for you to download at this address. Go ahead and I'll wait a second for you to write it down if you happen to be interested in it. Like I said, not just a pitch for what we do, but it's a pretty comprehensive paper about the, the ad monetized app ecosystem and how it's evolved over the past few years. So just some conclusions. Here's six things to take home if you're looking at speeding up mobile ad delivery and overall app performance. So look at investing in SDKs that beef up your back end, your analytics, so you can measure kind of what's actually going on in your app. And then, of course, mobile app acceleration, once you know what's happening, speeding it up that way. And if you're not measuring app speed and, and ad load times and things like that, it's really time to start. Don't just focus on crashes, also look at network errors and timeouts, and, and a lot of these analytics tools from people like Apptelligent, New Relic, and things like that can give you that information. Very important to look at multiple countries. If there's one thing to take away, it's just how discrepant those uh, various ad advertising uh, load times are um, across different countries. So wherever your users happen to be, make sure you're looking at those. Look closely at the speeds of your third-party URLs, your ads, your SDKs, things like that, and then measure and fix it. So that is the new mob portion, and we will now move on to your questions. Let me go in here and see what people have been asking. One second here. I know we have a few questions, so thank you very much. I'll read them off to the people that you've uh, asked them to. Let's see, the first question is from Brian, and uh, let me just open it up here real quick. Sorry about that. Ah, yes, what are the ad benefits? This is to Garrett. Uh, from Smato, what are the ad benefits of VR 360 videos? Well, great question. Uh, other than the implied benefits <laughs> um, by you know a, a truly immersive experience, I'm not, I'm not sure that the industry really knows the answer to that question yet. Um, you know, VR advertising is is nascent to say the least, although many people are already working on it and, and, and know that it's coming. Um, but you know, the, the benefits are, you know, if you're able to expose a user, expose a wearer, maybe is the right word to, to use, um, to an ad experience that is, is truly uh, immersive in, in a way that you cannot 
begin to even discuss or replicate in, a, in just a mobile device experience, um, you know, to, to say that you have the user's attention is, is you know, a, a massive understatement. Uh, so, you know, the, the ability for marketers and, and, and creative folks to design ad experiences that, that very cleanly interlace with the content or the game or the world or the thing that the, that the person is doing um, is a really unprecedented opportunity. Um, you know, what will that mean? Uh, you know, some, some percentage of that, that, that 3x gain in, in mobile ad spend, uh, but I think the world is still working on figuring that out. Great, thank you. The next question happens to be for Matt, and it's a pretty simple one, I think. Uh, can you just explain, the, Todd wants to know, can you explain what a DSP is? Oh, uh, demand side platform. We are the uh, ones who um, hook into the exchanges to evaluate and purchase the inventory that uh, app publishers are making available. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is for Numab, for me. Um, what, this is from Jesse. Thanks, Jesse. Um, what ad formats do these load times that I read off apply to? It's actually all ad formats. It's an aggregation. So we didn't break it out by, you know, this is interstitial, this is native, this is video, et cetera. So it, it's kind of an aggregation. Um, so yeah, sorry I don't have in, any more granular information there for you. Uh, I think, yeah, we have one other question here. Question for Garrett again. Um, kind of similar to the question that uh, Brian asked. This is from a different Brian. He wants to know, how should publishers prepare for new ad formats like VR360 and AR? Is that the responsibility of the monetization team, the creative team, or others? <laughs> it's, all, it's unfortunately all of the above. Um, you know, specifically with the question about PR, you know, it, it is about building a quote-unquote ad unit into the, the VR app, into the VR experience, um, and exactly what that means, um, you know, the, the, the world is still defining. I mean, there, there are specs out there that are e easily identifiable for, you know, sort of what you need to do in order to plug into a VR environment, but I don't think that they're necessarily standardized. Um, so, you know, building any ad unit into any app requires some work on the publisher's part. Uh, building an immersive sort of, you know, 360 degree movie experience that is an ad into uh, an application is, is a different animal. Um, I would say that if you're a publisher who's, who's working on an app, a VR app in general, you probably know how to do this already. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, making it possible to display or, or interlace uh, a, a VR ad into into an app, you know, is going to require a bunch of work from the publisher, but it's also going to require specific support from the marketers and, and the agencies that, that represent those those brand those advertising dollars or brand dollars, whatever, whatever they are. Um, you know, so th that's why um, these ad units, much like basically every new quote unquote ad unit, especially in the mobile environment, starts out in a very specialized silo, be they just specialized ephemeral ad networks or um, you know, a silo such as Snapchat or, or whatever. Um, but you know, it, takes, it takes some time for people to get good at it and for, for agencies and advertisers to understand how to work with it and how to measure it. Um, and then, and then you know, naturally it takes some time, uh, you know, native advertising is, is a great example. It, it takes some time for those things to really reach scale. Uh, but there's so much momentum behind advertising in, in mobile environments and especially around video. Um, I think that those, those growth patterns to reach scale are, are going to rapidly accelerate. Terrific. We said we were going to keep this to about 45 minutes, and we did that, give or take a minute or two. So I want to thank everybody who attended this today. Like I said, it's being recorded. You can find it most likely on our various websites and marketing channels afterward. You'll also get an email with a kind of summary and a link to it. Uh, thanks so much to Garrett at Smato, Matt at Therent, uh, for attending and presenting today. I hope you got some good information. and. Keep in touch with all three companies on Twitter and our various social media platforms for more uh, webinars in the future. Thanks again. Thanks very much, Jay.